Welcome everyone to our 17 of 48 of the OER Camp Global 2021. Um, this is a very special plenary keynote on the economic sustainability of OER models delivered by uh, Dr. Ahmed Talili, um, who currently serves as co-director of the OER lab at the Smart Learning Institute of Beijing Normal University, and among other things, serves as the editor of the Springer series, Future Education and Learning Spaces. As Kristen briefly mentioned, um, we're very much looking forward to your questions and comments um, after Ahmed's presentation. Um, and feel free to also open your mic and share with us. And other than that, uh, Ni hao Ahmed, a warm welcome to Beijing. Um, how are you? The stage is yours. So thank you so much, Tina, for this uh, warm introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers for this amazing like event. Honestly, I was like impressed how you brought like all these 48 hours together and also having experts and speakers from all over the world. So I really congratulate you for this amazing work and hopefully we can see it uh, every year. So for my presentation today, like you said, we will be talking about sustainability models for open educational resource. And we will be talking about one of the outcomes, which is like what happens when it comes to the evolution of sustainability models with insights from both the literature and experts. So I wanted to take the first slide to talk about uh, what's the definition of OER, because despite that, the concept or the term OER or open educational resources is not something new. It's quite surprising that a lot of people misunderstand OER and they simply think it's like free pizza. Means you find a resource online and then you use it the way you want. However, that's not the true definition. So here I wanted to start with like uh, the common definition given by UNESCO 2019, which is OER, any learning, teaching and research materials published in any format in the public domain, and most importantly, is under an open license. And this open license gives you the legal right on how to use that specific open educational resource. So basically, OER, it's not like you find something and then you decide to use it the way you want. It's always up to how it's published, what type of uh, license is assigned to that resource, and then you go from there. So what's the problem when it comes to open educational resources? Like we said, open educational resources are something for free under the public domain, which is helpful for students. They don't need to pay. They don't need to provide any fees, etc. So this is nice. But the problem is comes from the providers. What do we mean? For instance, if I am a university and I need to provide an open educational resource, I need to develop it. So development costs money. I need to put it online. So when I say put it online, I'm talking about paying for servers, paying for clouds, pay, the, pay, the, pay for technical support, etc. So here, the university is paying a lot of money to provide something for free, which is the open educational resource and could be beneficial to the students. The question is how the university or any OER provider can earn money and keep those open educational resources sustainable in line with the definition of OER. Of course, I still cannot charge you as a student because that will be against the definition of OER, but I still have to pay a lot of money. And this why, it comes OER sustainability challenge. How can I maintain providing courses, resources, whatever project is for four and five years for free to users, but I still earn money. And in here, we have one example from Jean Mitchell, and he is the overseas of Stanford University Open Program. And he predicted that also because of the lack of economic sustainability models, 
the university might turn away from offering free online courses. So this is a big challenge. Now, some of you might say, yeah, there are also some sustainability models which have already provided in the literature, which is totally true. But what's happening now? Now with the evolution of technology, we are talking about blockchain, we are talking about AI, we are talking about several technologies. The whole concept of OER is changing. So now we are implementing artificial intelligence methods, for instance, to search for OER or use blockchain, for instance, to protect OER authors. We are talking about copyright. So the whole OER ecosystem is changing. And the OER ecosystem, like 10 years ago, is not the same as OER ecosystem now. And the policy, maybe 10 years ago, are not the same policy of now in this current situation. So that's why what's happening in the past could be definitely useful, but might be outdated or need to be revised in line with the new trend and evolution of technology. And that's why we had to investigate how OER sustainability models have evolved in order to maintain providing OER for different users. This problem also has been highlighted by the UNESCO OER uh, recommendation. So we know at the end of uh, 2019, UNESCO has published its uh, OER recommendations and it focuses on five objectives. And one of the objectives is about sustainability. So we can see that the fifth objective folks on uh, offering uh, and creation of sustainability models for OER. And, and under this uh, objective, we have uh, one of the sub focus is reviewed uh, current provisions, policies, regulations, et cetera. So this is the first one. And the second one is catalyzing sustainability models. So not only through the traditional funding sources, but we also need to come up with the new methods in line with this evolution of technology and the changing of the OER ecosystem. So we can see here the importance of providing uh, uh, OER sustainability models so we can maintain providing OER services. And if we can say providing OER services, we are talking about inclusive education. We are talking about sustainable development goal four. So here we are talking about a lot of benefits in line with this uh, OER sustainability models. Therefore, in line with this context, we have conducted this project. So this project was uh, by the Smart Learning Institute of Beijing Normal University in China and also Unir University in Spain. And in this uh, method, we have focused on the triangulation method. So what do we mean by the triangulation method? So the triangulation method means that we will use multiple data sources to develop a comprehensive understanding of one specific phenomena. And of course, in our context is OER sustainability models. So as you can see here from our graph, we have the systematic review. So basically, we have reviewed all the literature using a systematic way, and we have identified eight OER sustainability models. Then we have run a Delphi method. And in these Delphi methods, we have obtained 10 OER sustainability models. So from this graph, maybe you can see, ah, we only identified two additional methods or two additional models. No, it's not true because later on we can like uh, dig deep in the results and we will see that some of the uh, models were merged together and the new models were also highlighted and provided by the experts. So we start with the first phase, which is a systematic review. So to conduct a systematic review, we have like the method uh, provided by Kishna uh, in 2004 and we have followed the Prisma flowchart so basically we have uh, research questions to answer, search keywords and databases, inclusion exclusion criteria and paper quality. So here you can see our searching keywords. So in order to search 
uh, for like those sustainability models in the literature. We have different keywords such as open education, open educational resources, OEP or open educational practices, open license and open access. So here you can see that we have combined mostly all the synonyms related to OER. And the second uh, string focus on models. So here we talked about sustainability models, funding models, business models, financial models. So as you can see from here, we tried to be as comprehensive as possible in order to identify as many uh, models highlighted by uh, previous authors as possible. So we have used these keywords in different databases, such as Science Direct, Taylor and Francis, IEEE Explorer, etc. And we have selected these databases because they are well known in computer science. So here we identified the search key and where to search. Next, which is very important, our filtering criteria or what we call inclusion exclusion criteria. How can we decide if a study is uh, convenient for our context, our research context or not? So we have a couple of inclusion exclusion criteria. For instance, if a paper is not written in English, we exclude it. And if a paper discusses sustainability models, but not in OER, we, uh, we exclude it, et cetera. And here, one of the things that we, uh, we excluded is papers that discuss sustainability models in other fields, including online learning in general or MOOCs. So even for MOOCs like massive open online courses, we have excluded them. Why? Because we have a lot of researchers talking about sustainability in MOOCs are quite different than open educational resources. Even in the literature, we have a lot of debate if MOOCs are considered as OER or not. So some of them say yes, some of them say no, because at the end, MOOCs are not published under an open license. However, MOOCs could be constituted from several OER. So here we have a lot of debate about MOOCs and their type, etc. So we have decided to exclude them in this research. So here you can see like, the PRISMA model, we have identified at the beginning 423 studies, and then we started the filtering process, etc. And we ended up with 35 studies at the end to deeply analyze and identify those OER sustainability models. So after analyzing those 35 studies, we have identified eight models. The first one is institutional, which means that the university covers the cost of OER as a par par part of their missions or like mandate. So all the cost will be covered by the institute. The second one will be the government. So here the government will uh, make some uh, national plans or like put a budget in order to cover uh, those uh, like uh, OER costs. So for instance, in China, we have a lot of projects uh, financed by the government, which encourage universities to develop open educational resources. And like we said, the cost will be uh, covered by the government or at least the budget will be covered by the government. So endowment, which means that the funding for OER is provided by charities or foundations, and this model, we can see it in a lot of free, uh, for instance, applications. On the side, you can find the note. If you like our software, please feel free to donate. So here it's like not mandatory, but if you like the service, you can feel free to donate. Also membership. So membership means uh, you can be a member in like specific course, and then you can pay for it. So here you don't need to pay to access the course, but you pay for membership and then, yeah, you can be like part of this like community and then you can pay for it. We have uh, also donations, freemium, uh, creator pay, sponsorship. So here, as you can see, we have eight models which were identified from the first stage 
which is the systematic review. Then we went to the second stage. So we have identified eight, like we said. Is this enough? How can we make sure that those eight are up to date? How can we make sure that those eight models are the needed models in nowadays? Like we said, those models were identified from the literature review. So to take one step forward, we have conducted Delphi method. So in Delphi methods, we have invited experts to review our eight models, maybe accept them, reject them, enhance them. So here we gave them like a lot of freedom to give us remarks. Of course, it will be like structured remarks, remarks in one specific form that they need to fill in. And here also, in order to make sure that our results are accurate, we had to carefully choose our experts. So basically, we have uh, chosen them according to their uh, two different criteria. For instance, they should be, or they must have OER as their research interest, because basically, if you could fo focus on online learning only, that would not be enough for us. So we need experts who can help to validate those models. So we chose a uh, research interest, which is OER. You should also have a good publication record in this area. You should have relevant position uh, in an active OER organizations. So as a result, we had 30 experts who uh, joined our experiment and validation. And these people are like OER UNESCO chairs in several countries, or, uh, editors of OER journals, professors and researchers working on OER in several uh, leading organizations such as the Commonwealth of Learning, ICD, and Alexa. So like we said, we had to pay a lot of efforts to select our experts, because like we said, those experts will define what type of results we will have later on. So that's why we did not want to select any expert in general, like distance education or online education. We had to be careful about our expert so we can provide a very solid uh, results that others could make use of hopefully in the future. So here uh, we asked them to give their inputs and eventually it led to a new classification of 10 OER sustainability models. For instance, some of the experts uh, suggested that we should merge uh, some of the models. So in the previous uh, classification, the one with eight models, we had governmental and institutional models provided separately. However, most experts highlighted that many universities are having mainly governmental funding. So at the end, the government is still responsible on both of these models. Therefore, separating them is not the accurate way. So like we said, we had like eight models, we had institutional and governmental. The experts said this is not very accurate because most of the universities still get funds from the government. So somehow at the end, the government is responsible on both of them. So that's why they suggested that we need to merge those uh, models together. Also, they suggested that donation and endowment models are having the same objective, which is mainly providing donations or giving the space for students or like users to feel free if they are interested to give donation or not, which is the same goal. So they also suggested that we merge these models together. So as you can see from here, like the expert highlighted a lot of uh, suggestions to enhance uh, our models. So basically the experts did not only like add two, two models so we can move from eight to 10. No, they gave a lot of uh, feedback so we can revise our models. And of course they highlighted new, uh, new models. So at the end, we had 10 OER sustainability models which were validated by them. So the first one is through internal funding. So that's why earlier we had university or institute 
uh, model and they changed it to internal funding. So uh, could be like OER support program. So here the university covers internally the creation and dissemination of uh, OER. Also, it could be a part of OER network. So here we could be like the university, like BNU, for instance, could be a part of a large consortium. And then we can share the cost with all these uh, like community or network in order to develop, uh, like to develop this OER. It is also through public funding. So public funding could be international or national or local public funding. So here it, it also could be like through grants because if the government give OER projects that you apply for, that's still governmental. So that's why they changed it to public funding in order to make it more appropriate. And then we have endowment or donations. So they merge them together. And also they have through sponsorship or advertisement. For instance, the a company could help me to uh, cover uh, like the cost of developing uh, the OER. But in return, I can advertise, let's say for their product, on my platform. But again, so this is a nice OER sustainability model, but again, here it raises a lot of tension when it comes to pedagogy. Like, is it okay if you show like some ads while students are learning? So also this is like a tricky part. It could be good as an OER sustainability model, but from the pedagogical perspective, this could be tricky. And that's why some of the models always need to further like uh, investigated in the future. And if they have any negative impact, I would say about learning outcomes, because you could be like focusing uh, on these like learning process and somehow like an ad pops up and it could like, like how to say, like blow your concentration up. So that's why we need to think about those models. Also by offering services to learners. So by offering services to learners means I could take the course for free, but you need to take some, if you want, of course, if you want some services, I, I can give it to you, but you need to pay for it. Means if I finish a course for free, that's very nice. But if you want a certificate, then you need to pay for it. So here you can see like the definition and the concept of OER is there because I'm providing everything for you for free, but additional services could be like a certificate, could be like assignment correction, could be maybe uh, help from the teacher. If you, if you need those services, then you need to pay for it. Another model, which is also quite interesting and needs a lot of investigation, but somehow it pops, off, pops out from our like experts, which is by offering learning related data to companies. So here, the students, learn for free, and then in return, we can use uh, like their data and sell it to companies as a return, like to cover the cost of OER. But again, here, we know a lot of tension about like privacy, ethics, and those things. So again, this model is, could help with OER sustainability models, but also comes a lot with a lot of limitation and challenges. So another thing is by producing OER on demand, like if you ask me to do something, then you pay me, then I develop this OER for you or by relying on OER authors. So it means if you are a passionate author and you wanna like uh, support OER, so you pay it by yourself or you develop it without asking for cost in return or for like salary in return or like community-based model. So here in total, we have 10 OER sustainability models that have been validated by our experts. And like I said, some of the models are beneficial to OER, but could raise a lot of tensions. Like we said, from the pedago pedagogical perspective, if you are talking about like advertisement while learning, we are talking about privacy and ethics. If you are going to sell our da the data of the students, etc. Then we asked our experts to rank those models according to the maturity of the OER model. Maturity means 
what which model is the most used model in your like country and you can see like the topest or the most used model is through public funding and in in second place comes through internal funding endowment etc so here we can see a lot of uh, like values given so for the standard deviation we can see that the sd standard deviation is uh, like changing like sometimes small like uh, 0.6 sometimes it's very big so for those small numbers means most of the experts agree on it means like most of the most of the experts agree that uh, through public funding is the most common mod uh, model used in almost all countries but for those bigger than one like uh, model 4 like model 2 and those so it's bigger than one. The SD is larger than one, which means that uh, the experts gave different opinions. And this is why, because here we are talking about culture, means maybe in my culture or at, or at least in my context, the government could be one of the supporters of OER, but in other cultures or in other contexts, the government does not play a strong role, at least in uh, promoting open educational resources. So in other places, maybe community could be working easily in the, to support OER. In other countries, it does not. If you are talking also about like selling data, we can know that selling data in several countries is almost forbidden, unless you give like a constant from the student, etc. But here also, we can see that uh, those models are there, but it depends from the context. And this is actually one of our uh, works that we are currently working on, is the impact of the context and culture on OER sustainability models. How culture and context could impact the development of one specific OER sustainability model over the other one or vice versa. So as we said, this is quite interesting. And if we can figure out this problem, we can help with the cross collaborations between countries to promote uh, OER sustainability models worldwide. Because I, I cannot come up for instance to some developing countries which are like struggling with normal basics of education. And we say, yeah, you should rely uh, on your government to develop uh, OER. So this is wrong. That's why we need to take into consideration culture and the context when we are talking about development and sustaining OER in general. So uh, at the end, this research uh, or this uh, project has led to one report and one paper. It's openly accessed on this link. I will later on copy paste the link uh, in our chat box if any one of you guys is interested in it, feel free to, to read it. And thank you so much for your interest and looking forward to your questions. Thank you.